So hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, it's great that we're you know all able to join again for our second session on COVID-19 vaccines. This time we're gonna be focusing around the globe, um, kind of pulling out our lens from the United States and, and looking at what COVID is doing um, in the rest of the world. I want to start by thanking our previous panelists um, and presenters for a fantastic discussion. And of course, um, our favorite moderator, uh, Francisco Becerra, for doing a fantastic job. Uh, we have another really engaging and important conversation coming up. Uh, so we will be starting with Dr. Rajiv Chowdhury, uh, who's a professor of global public health at the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. Um, he's also executive director of the Center for Non-Communicable Diseases and Research in Bangladesh. Uh, he's trained in nutritional and genetic epidemiology, as well as global health and clinical trial research, um, and is a Bill Gates Senior Award recipient for his contributions to global health. He'll be giving us an update on the COVID-19 pandemic, focusing on the South Africa region. That will be followed by a presentation by Dr. Oscar Franco, uh, who's director of the Institute of Social and Preventative Medicine at the University of Bern in Switzerland where he's also professor of epidemiology and, global, and public health, and is a medical doctor by training with an emphasis in cardiovascular disease prevention. Following those two presentations, we'll move into our panel, and I'll introduce the additions to our panel members at that time. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to these conversations and to your questions that you can submit through that open box that you see in front of you. Um, we will be receiving those and can pull those into the panel, but you can submit them at any time. Uh, and so for now, I'd like to move to our presentation from Dr. Chowdhury, please. Rajiv, you have the floor. So uh, Andrea, uh, can I just check that you can see my presentation and you can hear me fine? I can do both, thank you. Brilliant, thanks so much, uh, Andrea, for that very kind introduction. And uh, also, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers, Carlos, uh, Thomas, uh, and everybody for inviting me again uh, into this uh, very interesting, uh, very important summit. So my task today to talk about uh, South Asia and Africa to give you an update, uh, an overview of the so-called changing landscape that we can see in these two very large regions in the world. And I would focus on four specific things. I'll try to give you an overview with respect to disease burden and the actions that these regions and the countries within the regions have taken. Uh, I'll give you an update on the vaccine rollout and how that's uh, coming across uh, in this country's uh, economic implication of COVID-19 has been an important topic of discussion for uh, uh, these uh, impoverished countries, if you like. So I think that would be, uh, again, an important uh, struck an important component of my talk. And finally, I'll, I'll try to uh, give you an overview of what these countries are actually thinking with respect to uh, future resilience and recovery. So what has been thought about and what can be done. Um, so th that, that's the plan. I thought that it would be good for us to kind of remind ourselves with respect to these two large regions in the world. Uh, before I move on uh, with my presentation. Uh, South Asia and Africa uh, in aggregate, I think comprises almost about 45% of global population. So this is a very large chunk of the world population we're talking about. Unfortunately, uh, these regions also have the highest burden of uh, disease, both infectious and non-infectious. Um, these regions and the countries within it are home to almost three quarters of global extreme poor. And uh, as a result of which uh, we have seen historically, these countries have only invested roughly about 5% or less of uh, total GDP on health. Um, so historically underfunded uh, health structure. And um, we see a large uh, inequality uh, disparities within across these regions, as well as within uh, these regions and, and and just to give you that uh, the thought uh, before uh, we move on to COVID-19. So what's the current status of COVID-19 in, in these regions? Now um, this is uh, these are uh, the countries in South Asia uh, as you can see uh, from the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic back in March 2020. Uh, these countries have seen uh, 
several waves, uh, depending on which time you look at. And uh, if you remember that there was a very large hike uh, of um, new cases in India back in July, August, and uh, at the same time, this is actually Maldives, and uh, this is a very large spike in new cases per million in Maldives. And the timing is interesting, uh, you know, just to give you the reason why perhaps we say this, because Maldives is a, an island country which is very much reliant on uh, an inflow of tourists. So they opened up uh, in, in June and July, and, and in July and August, I think there were about 250,000 tourists who came in, and a good proportion of them came from India. So that might be one of the key contributing factors uh, of this big surge that uh, almost gone unnoticed uh, you know, in the world. We talk about Indian wave a lot, but you know, this, is, this is quite significant as well. But all in all, um, if you think about the global scenario, uh, if you compare these rates, I've, I've put India and Africa here and I've superimposed the rates for the same period of time for South America, just for comparison purpose, as well as the global estimates. You will see that generally, apart from this big hike uh, in, during the third deadly wave of India, the rates have generally been lower compared to the global estimates and uh, other developing settings like South America. So that's very interesting. And uh, if you talk about the present time, uh, they're generally uh, in, the, in the low side compared to other, other areas. Now, uh, what about Africa? So these are some of the countries I've picked based on their population size. So these are kind of the six most populous countries, if you like, within African uh, continent. And uh, again, uh, you see largely similar uh, picture here. Uh, there has been sporadic waves uh, of different countries in different time period. Uh, a big outlier here is South Africa, uh, as you can see here. And they saw significantly high spikes of cases, three distinct waves compared to other countries. Now, uh, one reason of it would be uh, perhaps the testing operations, which is very different uh, in South Africa compared to some of the other uh, continental uh, neighbors. I'll, I'll go into the rate of testing soon. Now, what about the uh, SARS-CoV-2 variance proportion? So these are for the two most populous countries within the South Asian region, India and Bangladesh. And if you look at the timeline here, and if you look at uh, you know, the different uh, variants that we have uh, seen over the time. Uh, presently, in both these countries, Delta variant is the most prevalent variant, uh, which is, uh, which you can see in other countries across South Asia as well. And a very similar picture also in African countries have picked up uh, South Africa and Nigeria here. And one thing uh, that I should perhaps point out at this point, that um, the the contribution of the of the genomic data when it comes to uh, you know the the sequencing of of the samples for uh, looking at these variants in detail uh, these regions have been underrepresented uh, in uh, you know big databases like gis aid i think african continent contributes less than one percent of all of the uh, you know sequence data that's that's available in that database so so again what we see is uh, you know uh, generally uh, another uh, source of inequity in in uh, genomic data available for different variants across these regions. Now, with respect to death, uh, again uh, the the picture is largely similar uh, with the incidence. You see uh, again uh, somewhat lower uh, rates uh, of death. Uh, over time, if you compare with the global estimates as well as the South, Amer South American estimates. So they're generally lower. And um, again, the outlier here is Maldives, but still uh, in the big picture uh, within the South Asia, the rates of death uh, you know, uh, has been generally slow and, and low. So why, why, why that would be? Uh, what, what could be the potential explanations to it? Uh, one major distinction that we see is um, the how the different countries in different regions they've varied in uh, testing stats. 
And generally, the rates of testing uh, in all these countries have been much lower compared to the West. I think it's very fair to say. And, and that could be one reason uh, why we perhaps see much less uh, uh, you know, cases as well as deaths compared to other regions in the world. There could be other potential explanations. Uh, we know that in Africa, in South Asia, these are generally younger populations. Less than 10% uh, of the overall population would be over 60, you know, the, the age group that's more vulnerable for adverse outcomes of COVID-19. Uh, there has been massive underreporting of deaths at the community level, and that has been uh, due to uh, a lot of factors like stigma, like access, uh, you know, uh, to, to healthcare, etc. Uh, when uh, the individuals actually arrived at the hospital, there has been incidents of undercounting and misclassification uh, massively across uh, hospitals, and partly because uh, you know uh, of the lack of testing, that a heart failure death. We, we, we didn't know that whether this is heart failure, uh, genuine heart failure death, or it's you know, COVID-19 leading to um, uh, complicating a heart failure case. Uh, also, these countries generally, they don't have any uh, ele electronic health records, if you like. So no national morbidity and mortality registration system to ascertain all of the deaths uh, as well as the uh, non-fatal outcomes properly. So there could be a cadre of reasons why we see uh, this, this paradox, if you like. But interestingly, if you look at the case fatality rate, uh, which is essentially you know, the number of um, uh, deaths and the denominator is confirmed COVID-19 cases, you would see it's quite fascinating. So this is Egypt, Sri Lanka, Ethiopia, South Africa, Afghanistan, Pakistan, some of the South Asian and African countries as well as Bangladesh, you know, their uh, case fatality rates as it stood in end of September were actually uh, higher than the global uh, case fatality rate. Uh, although, you know, in uh, broad picture, the, the, the rates, the death rates seem low, but the case fatality rates are actually, you know, uh, there is a diversity there. So there are some countries where you actually see a lot higher case fatality rate, perhaps reflecting uh, the health systems uh, to some extent. So what about the action? So this is the stringency uh, index uh, done by the uh, University of Oxford group. And essentially this is an index where, uh, you know, the, it's, it's based on nine response indicators from school closures to workplace closures, travel bans, et, et cetera. And they're color coded. So how well the countries did uh, with respect to the stringency index. And as you can see there, it's, it's quite diverse. So only a few countries would have, uh, you know, higher scores in this stringency index. So they're not very stringent when it came to the public health uh, action. And uh, this is reflected here uh, with respect to the mobility data. Uh, this is again from South Africa and India. You can see that uh, although, uh, you know, the proportion of people who spend time at home went up during the initial phases of the epidemic, uh, of the pandemic, but then it gradually came down and then went up again for India during that deadly, uh, you know, uh, third wave, but again, significantly came down. And one of the reasons why this is, 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 is economic. And, and we'll get into it uh, at the latter stage. And uh, as you can see from here, uh, with respect to the income support uh, in African continent by the government, and how they were covering, for example, the salaries and, and, and giving direct cash payments. Uh, this is reflected here. And in most of the countries, you would see either absolutely no income support or uh, income support available, uh, which covered only less than 50% of the lost salary. And, 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 and there is no country that got more than 50% of their uh, lost salary covered uh, by the government. So you can, you can see the economic resilience that there is no, uh, you know, uh, safety net per se um, in, in this. And, and the picture was pretty similar uh, in, so in, in South Asia as well. Now, what about the vaccine rollout? What we see here is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. I was very intrigued by the first session where we were talking about the US, for example, the key problem here seems like you know, how we can get vaccinated, you know, get the remaining 20% or 30% Americans getting vaccinated. 
the, the problem here might be slightly different. Uh, the, the status of uh, current vaccination are given here. Uh, I've got UK, European Union, United States, just as reference countries. And then you have the South uh, Asian countries, you have South Africa, some of the uh, African countries here as well. And what, what we can see immediately is that how different the estimates are uh, in, in some of these countries where less than 5% of uh, the overall population have got uh, even one shot uh, uh, on their hand. So it's, it's, it's a pandemic of the unvaccinated that we see in South Asia as well as in African continent. So the WHO actually had a goal that, uh, you know, we, we have to vaccinate at least about 40% of the population in every country by end of this year and 70% by mid-2022. But if you can see uh, the, the share of total population here, we are nowhere near it. And uh, so the estimates so far as it stands in Africa, only 15 out of 54 total countries have achieved a 10% target, which was set for September. And as we stand today, two countries, Burundi and Eritrea, actually they haven't started uh, you know, rolling out the vaccination program. And uh, currently, if we go business as usual, Africa will only reach 40% of target by April 2022. So, so the problem here is availability of vaccine uh, rather than you know, uh, perhaps getting people have it. With respect to the acceptance rate, um, the, this is a very interesting, uh, helpful uh, review, which was done by Solis and colleagues, uh, who came out in Nature Medicine a couple of months ago. It, it, it shows that the countries in uh, these low income settings in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as in South Asia, generally, if you pull everything, you know, the overall estimates show that roughly around 80% individuals were actually, uh, you know, accepting the, the, uh, the vaccination. But um, the, the factors that um, actually was, uh, you know, um, affecting the hesitancy that we saw in, you know, 20, 25 percent individuals in these countries, um, there has been a lot of surveys that actually uh, try to answer that question. So I've summarized this here uh, for South Asia and African continents um, into four different categories. So you have these factors uh, which are related with the vaccine. So which vaccine they're getting so that the type of vaccine mattered uh, and the other classic things like side effects, safety, effectiveness also matter uh, you know, when it came to hesitancy. There were some structural factors because some of the vaccination centers were so far from household that was uh, a driver uh, of, of hesitancy. Also, some of these vaccination centers were very highly populated, so people were actually fearful that if I go there for vaccination, whether I would be infected. So that actually was one of the one of the factors as well. And, and, and the classic rule of disinformation, so individuals in all these countries, uh, among the hesitants, uh, the, they tend to have uh, social media as their primary source of information. And there were classic socio-political uh, factors like uh, mistrust in government, so uh, different governments acted differently and whether government were giving them proper, uh, you know, care, proper vaccines, proper information, there was a lot of mistrust in especially sub-Saharan African countries, there were religious beliefs uh, that also acted, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in various settings where uh, people actually, uh, they thought that prayers, uh, for example, in Pakistan, in, in Ghana, in these two countries, they the hesitants actually say that, you know, praying uh, several times a day is actually better than getting vaccinated. So there are lots of socio-political, uh, you know, uh, misbelief that also contributed to hesitancy in these settings. So economic impact. Um, so this is uh, inflation uh, that, that we can see. So how, you know, the, the purchasing capacity and, and the cost of, uh, you know, uh, the goods uh, have have contributed to this inflation, and if you look at this particular um, uh, line here, which is for South Asia, how that went up, uh, although uh, has started to come out a bit, but again, uh, this is quite significant for these uh, poor economies. 
with respect to impact on food and security. Again, this is from uh, Asian Development Bank recent report, which shows how uh, in um, developing Asia, the price of food has gone up substantially and, and as did at some point energy prices as well. The exports uh, declined and then uh, now has slowly started to bounce back a bit, which is good news. And, and, and this is uh, this green line shows the dip uh, with respect to exports. Things like uh, uh, ready-made garments uh, went down substantially, which is kind of the bread and butter of some of the South Asian countries. It has started to pick up uh, gradually, which is, which is good to see. The tourist inflow, again, some of the South Asian countries that rely heavily on tourism, and that uh, you know, had a nosedive as we expected after the onset of um, the pandemic. And uh, this is Asia and Pacific, this is Africa. Um, and, and then it has started to come up a little bit, but again, still not uh, at, the, at the level of the pre-pandemic stage yet. So the recession, uh, the depth of recession, as you can see uh, in terms of real GDP growth rate uh, in uh, various parts of the world, and this is Asia, the, the, the dark green one, and then the Africa. Uh, again, the picture is very similar. There was a massive drop uh, in, you know, in the first phase of the pandemic. It has started to come back a bit, uh, which is again, uh, very promising. Now, what is quite concerning though, is the number of um, new poor or extreme poor individuals defined as you know, having an income of about uh, 1.9 US dollars per day per, per person. Uh, how many new individuals have actually been pushed to poverty uh, thanks to uh, COVID-19? And, and, and as, as you can see from here for different scenarios, uh, there has been estimations that in African continent alone, about 60 million individuals so far have been now pushed to, uh, you know, below the poverty line. And the numbers are very similar, about 80 million, uh, uh, as far as World Bank is concerned, in South Asia as well. So we, we have almost doubled the number of extreme poors in the last two years. And the fiscal deficit, um, as you can see, uh, with respect to the the shortfall from uh, expenditure and income of the government uh, has widened uh, in East Africa, in North Africa, South Africa, West Africa, anywhere you look at, and the pictures are very similar. And when that happens, the, the, what, the impact is on debt. So the countries are now borrowing more. So in back in 2000, uh, about 71% uh, of the GDP was, uh, you know, based on, um, uh, based on, the, the real income and now uh, significant progress were made in the first 10 years and we are now back to that 2000 uh, you know uh, stage uh, uh, where we so essentially all the economic progress uh, in the in the last 20 years have been lost uh, in uh, in african continent so what can we do um, going forward I think it's it's important for us to think about what might actually happen worldwide. I, I really found um, uh, colleagues Talenty and uh, and others this this paper in Nature, which came out uh, a month or so ago, where they described three possible scenarios. Firstly, uh, there could be you know uh, this is the most worrying scenario, if you like, that ongoing cycles of pandemic, as we can see that there is a new wave, and and, and then it comes down, then again. Uh, we, we see it back up after a couple of months or so, so there would be repeated cycles like this. And, uh, but, you know, we still have to, uh, you know, if, if that happens, we'll have to have a better coverage of vaccination, better surveillance and testing. That's the only way to kind of uh, keep this uh, stem in, in check, if you like. The second possible scenario is, is, a, is probably more likely one, which is a transition to a seasonal disease epidemic scenario where you are bringing down the infection levels equivalent to, say, uh, flu or even lower than that. But again, uh, if we have to maintain it, uh, a wide coverage of vaccination would be needed. We will also need effective ther therapies. You know, uh, if you must have seen the news that uh, you know WHO has has, uh, uh, has approved molnupiravir, uh, which is a new generation of uh, oral antiviral drugs. So, so this is 
really good news. And, and the other scenario could be that, you know, uh, we can transi transition into an endemic disease stage. So uh, again, this is uh, something where, you know, you, um, it's, it's an endemic disease similar to human coronaviruses or other coronaviruses with a much lower disease impact. But the problem there is that we actually don't know uh, that, uh, you know, when the SARS-CoV-2 would be adapted to humans, whether that will increase or reduce its, its virulence. So that is the uncertainty in this, uh, in this particular scenario. So, so what is needed is, uh, is wide vaccination. And as we saw the gaps and the impact on that on manufacturing is, is quite critical. As you can see, it's almost uh, you know, uh, linearly correlated. So the more vaccination uh, proportion you see in different countries, the higher the manufacturing performance monitor indicator. So vaccination is key for the workers to carry on working in a, in a safe environment. So what is actually driving this vaccine inequity in the world? Firstly, um, the Serum Institute of India was the main uh, driver of the, this COVAX mechanism, if you like. And uh, there has been the export halt uh, by the Serum Institute of India. Uh, there, it may, may open in October, but again, Indian government has said probably the Asian countries would be prioritized first. Uh, the, the low income and middle income countries have been deep prioritized because uh, you know, the richer countries, obviously, they, they, uh, they, they, they booked the first uh, batches of, of the vaccines and uh, also, uh, you know, uh, they hoarded, if you like, uh, some of the vaccines. And, and that has been a major problem. Uh, also, at the country level, there has been logistical issues when the vaccines are actually available. They were uh, delayed in regulatory approval. There were not proper uh, infrastructure available for a nationwide uh, rolling out. Uh, so those logistical issues were there. And, but what is quite uh, critical here for us to think about this is so-called broken promises of the pledges. So we, we know that uh, the, you know, to end the pandemic, we need about 11 billion doses. But then uh, the high income countries you know, pledged over a billion, but only about 120 million so far. So about 15% have been given to uh, COVAX so far. So this is what is driving the current situation when it comes to vaccine inequity. But the uh, what's important to note is that uh, uh, the vaccines alone will not end the pandemic. So we do need effective medical tools like you know, proper testing operations. We need proper medications. We need availability of oxygenation uh, services. Uh, we also need effective public health tools like uh, engaging with the communities, mobilizing the, the, the community volunteers. Uh, that, that will be key for these countries with poor resources. And they have the precedence uh, of it. Um, and also, I think that going, going forward, if we really have to know how the virus is changing and which variant is evolving in which place and how do we then you know, uh, modify our action based on that, I think it's extremely important that we achieve the equity in uh, genomic surveillance. I think that is key as well. Otherwise, you know, uh, we will never know that whether there is a local outbreak happening if, if uh, we, we don't have that improved as well. With respect to economic resilience um, and uh, accelerating the recovery, uh, several things have been proposed by a number of different institutions. I've just picked up some of them. Uh, you could split them into three broad categories. So how we can uh, you know, secure health, uh, how we can uh, achieve health security financing, how we can uh, essentially do financial sector reforms, how we can involve multilateral development, bank financing. And uh, so, for example, G20 independent panel suggested that all these countries, they should um, you know, increase their domestic health spending by 1% of GDP for the next five to 10 years. And, and, and this, is, this is, again, a goal that everyone needs to sign up to. Uh, there are other uh, suggestions like uh, this so-called fair share mechanism, where different countries, for example, in South Asia, under the SARC or South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation, they came up with uh, you know, uh, an idea that they can pool resources, which would be based on uh, proportionate to the size of the economy, 
and the size of the population. So this kind of multilateral financing mechanism could be very, very important. How you can reform the private uh, banking sector in this country so that you could pool resources, reallocate resources for any emergency response fund. So uh, these are some of the examples and, and there, uh, there are many other good examples which you know, the countries can pick from. But I think, I think there needs to be a nice synergy, there needs to be a good uh, coordination when it comes to these important uh, domains of, um, of, of targets for economic resilience and, 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 and moving the recovery forward. So I would finally like to just talk about this US hosted global COVID-19 summit that ended September 22nd, so a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it brought in uh, over 100 governments, over 100 leaders from all international organizations, from UN to WHO, uh, also private sector, philanthropic sectors, etc. Uh, in the last session, we talked about the requirement of uh, a, a concerted approach, a concerted uh, way forward. I think this this was really really good uh, effort to to and and US took a leadership uh, on that, and 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 uh, there were four different themes which came out from this. Uh, from this meeting uh, with a, a number of uh, targets for each one of those themes. And the themes are vaccinating the world, how we can make sure that there is an equitable access to vaccines worldwide, uh, because we realize that we are not safe uh, until everybody is safe worldwide, and, and how we can give immediate clinical and medical uh, support for saving lives now, uh, you know, the plans about building back uh, better and also the global uh, collaboration that's needed. And if you go into the details of these uh, proposals, you know, there are several targets which have been given uh, for each one of these themes, which I think is a, is a good start and uh, you know, um, a travel to, to the right direction. So for the interest of time, I'll, I'll uh, stop here and I look forward to have uh, questions and discussions later on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Chowdhury, for your presentation. You've really given us a lot to think about in terms of the fluctuations in the pandemic and the highly contextualized nature of morbidity around the world, um, pervasiveness of equity and access issues that it's a bit discouraging to realize that we're still thinking about all of this and seeing all of this. I'm really looking forward to the panel questions that I know uh, we're going to be seeing a lot of discussion on these topics that you've raised. Um, so thank you for that and for bringing, for bringing that to our attention. Um, I'd like to transition now to uh, Dr. Oscar Franco's presentation. Um, as I mentioned, he'll be joining us from Bern. Um, he'll be discussing COVID-19 in Europe um, and providing an update on case counts and vaccine access um, and some of the topics that Dr. Chaudhary had mentioned, but giving us the European perspective uh, so, uh, Dr. Franco, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Andre, and thank you very much for all the organizers and, and our wonderful colleagues that are joining us today. After the brilliant presentation from my colleague, Rajiv Chaudhuri, there is not much more to add. Uh, so I thought of sharing with you what is happening or what the feeling is in Europe or how things are happening in Europe since the last time. The last time that I attended this summit was in February. And since February, uh, the feeling that you seem to get in Europe when you walk in the street is that most people uh, tend to think that we are sort of going back to normal. Even if it's true or if it's not, there is a collective feeling that situations are um, being solved and going back to normal. And we saw it during the summer. This was a, a picture of uh, a beach in Europe during the summer. And we saw it also with uh, the return of massive events. This, is, this was the UEFA Europe uh, 2020, which was actually celebrated in 2021. As you can see, fully crowded stadiums uh, without masks, without protections, without distance. We saw the return of Champions League, UEFA Champions League. We, we really like football uh, here or soccer, how you call it in America, in, in Europe. And uh, this is an unfortunate uh, game between Barcelona and Bayern Munich. But anyway, we saw a return of, of football. Uh, some of the stadiums apply a mask. As you can see here, some of the public have masks in the background, as you can probably see it in a blue way. But some other stadiums do not. And this has been also the case uh, in general in Europe. It was, has been a heterogeneous approach towards restrictions. 
we saw our, our Super Bowl, which is the Tour de France, taking place completely uh, as crowded as it has always been, um, like back to normal. And we saw in September 10 that Denmark was the first European country to drop all COVID restrictions and going back, as I mentioned, to that feeling of normality. In the cafes, in the restaurants, what we are seeing now is uh, cafes that are open, restaurants that are open. Normally, you have to present your COVID pass, which is a QR code that you carry on your mobile. And these are normally checked by the members of the restaurants, either the waitress, however, that they have not been trained for this. And there has been a lot of discussion of who is responsible for what in terms of checking uh, COVID-19 uh, passes when they come to these uh, restaurants. Flights are returned to normal. There is no longer a space left between seats. Uh, people do wear a mask. Q uh, the passes are also checked, but are relatively back to normal. And in class, we, saw, we have seen some universities that are going uh, towards a hybrid model where we have some students joining online, some students essentially by keeping distance while other universities are just back to normal. But how much are we really back to normal? If we look at Europe as a region, and we, I put here Europe and European Union, because the entire continent uh, does not, is not all part of the European Union, and the European Union are some specific states. And what we can see here is that, uh, yes, during the, just before the summer, there was a reduction in cases. There was an increase after the summer holidays. However, uh, for what we expected after coming back from holidays, after all the traveling, after the Euro Cup, Champions League, Tour de France, etc., what we have seen is that, uh, and considering the, the, the threat that we had from the Delta variant, uh, what we have seen is that there's been a slight increase, but it hasn't been as bad as we expected. In general, what we do see is inequalities in terms of how things are behaving in Europe as a region and the European Union. And when we look at the countries with the highest increase in the last weeks, we can see countries in Europe like Serbia, Montenegro, or Lithuania that are having among the highest increases in the world right now. So what, what is happening? When we look at, uh, again, Europe in comparison to North America or to South America, as Rajiv uh, already presented, Europe is, is doing relatively well compared, for example, with North America. South America has uh, experienced an, an even bigger increase, but European Union is doing even better. And in terms of vaccination, we see here in the chair of the population by region, the European Union really leading in terms of coverage of the entire region. However, the big differences compared to Europe. And this is basically what we have seen, that feeling of normality, that feeling that uh, really COVID is not as bad as uh, we have been told. That's what the population has been uh, expressing. There's been a lot of manifestations, a lot of complaints. Uh, we have seen them all across Europe, a big protest, 5,000, 10,000 people in Amsterdam, in Bern, in Paris, in London, all over Europe, people rebelling and rebelling more and wanting to go back to normality. We saw, however, in August, uh, how France, one of the countries with one of the lowest levels of uh, acceptability for vaccination, so this is pre his president, uh, Macron, uh, coming out with the new rule uh, that COVID passes will be required uh, from August for people to be able to enter planes, trains, and uh, restaurants. And we saw this being responded by even more protests uh, about uh, considering what was happening in France as a dictatorship or considering them as draconian measures or violations of individual liberties. The truth is, is that while France at the beginning of this year had more almost 50% of its population not willing to be vaccinated, what we are seeing is after August, when this was implemented by Macron, um, we saw within one day uh, that one million French people made an appointment to get a vaccination. And since then, 
we have seen the amount of people that do not want to get vaccinated being uh, decreased by half of what we had at the beginning of the year. A country that we know was famous for having a reluctance towards vaccines and towards imposed measures. So um, when we talk about skepticism towards vaccines or when we talk about uh, how to improve the acceptance rate uh, of people wanting to get vaccinated, we have seen an example in France of things that can work, although there has been drastic measures. I don't know whether communication or education is going to do any benefit uh, further than what we have done so far. The evidence has been there, it has been collected. However, what we have seen is an increase in reluctance from populations of wanting to get vaccinated. At the same time, um, while uh, this is happening, uh, we've seen that the economic situation in Europe, while in the year uh, 2020, we saw a decrease of 8.3, which was the worst in, in the world. We see that there is a recovery, Rajiv already mentioned before, a recovery that is far uh, faster than expected and a recovery that is uh, not at all like the one uh, we saw when we had the economic crisis in the year 2008, 2007, 2008. And we saw then uh, in that time, a recovery that took very long, it was very slow. And at this time, we expected the same with COVID. However, what we have seen is a, a lot faster recovery. These are also positive news. And in general, uh, it is believed that this is the case because the previous economic crisis occurred within uh, the financial system. There were faults within the financial system, while here, these were uh, circumstances that were extrinsic to the financial system. And however, what we are seeing in Europe is as well a heterogeneous rate of recovery with countries like Spain or France expecting to half an increase in the economy in this year of 7% compared to other countries that have, uh, like for example, the UK that is having a lot of issues right now uh, after the Brexit and with availability of food, mm -hmm. uh, petrol, etc., or countries like Germany that is seeing uh, an improvement, but not at the same level as other countries in Europe. And uh, we are now also entering a phase where we are talking about uh, maybe uh, starting to understand that, that it won't be a chance that to eradicate uh, COVID-19, to get rid of COVID-19 completely, but we will have to learn to live with it. And probably what we will live is with, in, with an endemic uh, virus that is going to be recurring and is going to be continuing to affect the population. We don't know for how long. But given that the immunity, uh, because of vaccines or because of not, uh, infection, we don't know how long it will last. And maybe it will start to decrease after four months or after five months. We're going to start seeing populations needing a third dose, perhaps a fourth dose. And we are seeing already how uh, Europe and many other high-income countries start to buy more and more and more uh, vaccines, which brings us to the fact that why the high income countries keep on hoarding, keep on purchasing and accumulating dosages. At the other side, the dark side of the moon, we are seeing low income countries that are being affected and being left behind and being ignored. Affected by issues such as corruption or logistical challenges, or even uh, having even more issues with vaccine hesitancy, as we have seen a lot of a spread of misinformation in social media like Facebook and WhatsApp, and having health systems that are a lot weaker than high income countries. And here, the dark side of the moon, Latin America, Africa, remains to be prioritized. So the immediate challenges that remain, we need to reduce the inequalities of vaccination within the region, Europe, and also all over the world. Genomic vigilance has been improved. However, it's still not at the level that we require to be able to be more alert for the appearance of new variants and how they could behave. The communications against vaccine skepticism needs to increase. I don't know how much we can reach through communication or whether we need to start taking measures like the measures being taken in France. I'm not a politician, I don't wanna talk about that, but I do, uh, as a public health scientist, we do require to protect the population. And we will need to take tough decisions of whether 
to protect individual rights or collective rights, or put them in a balance and identify a strategy that can suffice both and can protect the population and at the same time not violate the individual rights. The economic recovery is going well, is going better than expected, it could be worse, it's not perfect, but it's going in the right pathway. And the future of the vaccine programs need to be defined. Countries need to get independence in their production of their own vaccines. And this is particularly a case for lower middle income countries that do not have the infrastructure, they don't have the technology, and this needs to be provided and needs to be supported towards the future. At the same time, within Europe, we keep, not, we keep on seeing a heterogeneous approach towards restrictions, towards travel policies, schools, the way that we handle the economy, et cetera. And I hope that towards the future, there is a little bit more coordination uh, in the region. Finally, we need to remember uh, that we have been living in abnormal circumstances for far too long. And many of us will face the anxiety of going back to normality or going back to the office or going back to public transport. Some of, some of uh, portions of the population have also suffered COVID-19, have the consequences that are taking long-term that we have called long COVID. And these populations will require support and rehabilitation. Are we ready to go back? And after this is solved, if it's ever solved, is this the solution to all the issues that we're facing? The reality is that uh, COVID-19 is perhaps like this underwater volcano that uh, erupted in the middle of a gigantic tsunami of common chronic diseases that are really affecting our population. Common chronic diseases that are not only affecting our population, but also planetary health. And we are still ignoring the importance of promoting, facilitating, enhancing a healthy lifestyle in order to improve individual population and planetary health. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Franco, for your presentation. That was so meaningful. And you really mentioned a lot of several important points. It was really good to see the statistics of the of Europe and the European Union broken apart like that as they are so often lumped together, but they really seem to tell very different stories and have really different experiences. Um, I'm also interested to learn more about the intersections with planetary health that you mentioned there at the end. Hopefully in our panel, we get some questions around that. Um, so we are gonna transition to our panel discussion now. Um, so we'll have just a brief break while the tech team moves us over and I will introduce our panel at that time. Have our panelists here joining us. Uh, Dr. Chowdhury, of course, uh, you remember from the first presentation and Dr. Franco from the second, uh, but we are now joined by Maria Elena Botazzi. I'm very happy that she is able, able to join us. She's the Associate Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor University's College of Medicine in Houston uh, with Dr. Peter Hotez, um, as well as a professor of pediatrics specializing in tropical medicine, molecular virology and microbiology. Um, she's the co-director of the Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development and a distinguished professor of biology at Baylor as well. Um, she spent more than 20 years working on the design and knowledge of vaccines around coronaviruses even before the pandemic. Um, and my personal favorite was recognized as one of the world's top 100 women in global health. Uh, welcome, Dr. Botazzi, to our panel discussion. Thank you. So, Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Um, I would like to get us started um, with a couple of questions that have come in uh, from Dr. Chowdhury's presentation. Um, there has been a lot of conversation around high income countries hoarding COVID vaccines. Um, that phrase hoarding has been used at least by the media here in the US um, that the UK and Canada have enough COVID vaccines to fully inoculate their entire populations three times over. Um, double in the U.S. With vaccination rates being so 
low in LMICs um, in low and middle income countries. Do you believe that these stockpiles in high income countries are a factor in those low coverage rates? Or do you think these are manufacturing issues? Is there an ethical obligation here that we're missing? Just interested in your thoughts on that. Well, I think um, the, the excess vaccine um, stockpile, if you like, um, you know, um, the, the, the inability to actually spare some of those unused ones for low and middle income countries uh, has been a, a contributing factor to the overall shortage, if you like. Uh, the pledges have been made by the G20, uh, the pledges have been made by different groups, different times, uh, but, you know, they're not properly uh, met. And sometimes, you know, it, this also happened that the vaccines, when they were sent, um, they were so near the expiry date that, that actually they were not usable or, or, or safe to use. So there has been a lot of uh, hesitancy, you know, and, and confusion when it came to sharing, um, you know, um, uh, the vaccine. So, so I think it's 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 really sometimes it's a strategic call for the governments as well in the in the Western or the or the affluent settings, if you like, that uh, whether we should uh, keep vaccines for a booster shot or whether we should go for our kids to be vaccinated. Uh, again, the science, you know, you, you have to uh, make an evidence-based decision. Sometimes the evidence were not available at the time that perhaps contributed to the delay of the decision to share it. And by the time we got to the science, you know, uh, they were almost expired. And then the confusion with uh, some of the vaccine side effects, uh, you know, um, that, that, that was a major uh, issue as well uh, for AstraZeneca, for example. Uh, lots of different, uh, you know, countries, they stopped using uh, that particular vaccine uh, and, 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 and whether those could be transferred to the LMICs, you know, again, there were confusions around that. So I think, I think to some extent uh, that has uh, definitely um, been a factor, I would say, uh, that, that kind of, um, uh, you know, stockpile or, or hoarding, uh, however you, you frame it. But uh, one of the, I think the most, uh, you know, key factor now is the, for the Serum Institute of India to stop sending, uh, you know, to exporting uh, the, the vaccines, which were the main kind of contributor towards the COVAX mechanism. So that is probably the biggest reason, and that has to do with part manufacturing, part perhaps local politics and local needs. Um, but then uh, the, as far as the Western countries and the stockpiling there is concerned, it has been a factor, but perhaps not the biggest factor. Can I jump in and maybe give an a, a, a additional perspective around what Dr. Uh, Chad Hurry just mentioned? So if we, if we put ourselves back at the beginning of the uh, pandemic, clearly the, the fact that I, uh, indeed most of the doses were assigned primarily to the high income countries really provided a huge delay in deploying them in low middle income countries and certainly lower, um, the lower of the uh, uh, income countries. And, and that delay of some countries like US that we were already vaccinating pretty much in December and countries that even up to today, they're still struggling to get you know, uh, some, that's definitely um, you know, have had an enormous impact in the fluctuations and the um, certainly the variability of this, of, of this pandemic. Um, and that's now ha what has led to this concept that the high income countries are still hoarding or that they're still having some uh, excess, um, which it's a reality. But I think the reality now is even with that excess being deployed, which I believe um, it should be at some level deployed and we're seeing some donation structures being advanced, but those donations are not going to be enough because of the change again of the epidemiology of the virus, the fact that again, we're now needing to eventually increase the amount of needs because of the third doses plus the um, pediatric um, age ranges. So we not only were of course delaying the low middle income countries access, the fact that the fluctuation in epidemiology now requires a lot more um, the donation is just not going to be enough. 
Maybe a, a, a one, one note with regards to the expiry date. I think I have to honestly tell you, it's all communications, right? Because these vaccines were being made uh, and evaluated, including their stability, as we were deploying them. So expiry doesn't really apply because you're building that stability information along the way. So maybe a lot that you had information that was certainly stable for three, six, nine months. Now probably we have data that those lots are still available and stable uh, to proceed. So I think that we made a, the, the wrong label. So there was a lot of discussion, certainly in the realm of production, which is where I live, usually in the in the production aspects of, of vaccine, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, development. Um, they sh it should have been better communicated that the stability profile of these vaccines was being built along the way, and therefore it's very unlikely that these vaccines really had been expiring, right? If you maintain them at the right temperatures because I think that also gave the wrong perception to countries that they were receiving a material and, and, and lots that were at the end of, of, of their life, which is probably not really reflective of the truth. Um, so again, you know, a couple of you know, scenarios here, the reality is that it may have had certainly a huge uh, impact, but donations alone are not gonna resolve it either. Um, so back to you. If, if I may jump in as well, because this is a fantastic topic and Dr. Vosati and Dr. Shaduri have presented really interesting topics. I will argue that this is the one of the driving factors of uh, what the situation that we are seeing in low and middle income countries. I think we have witnessed an enormous social injustice during this pandemic. And we have seen selfish uh, countries that have been hoarding, and I think that's the word. We have even, the UK has purchased close to five times the amount of vaccines to compare to this population. And unfortunately, as uh, Dr. Botas was saying, the vaccines are stable, they last longer, but because of the way they were authorized, the way the way, the way uh, has been labeled, they have uh, a date that is probably not reflective of its uh, real stability and duration. And many countries have to follow these dates. And we saw already at the end of May, countries like Malawi, it was one of the first in the news that burned close to 20,000 dosages of AstraZeneca because they were too close to the end date. And we saw also a paper in the BMJ that was talking about cl how close to 4 billion dosages of vaccines were close to expiring by the end of October. And they were mainly concentrated in the UK, Canada, European Union, and the US. And these are not being used and they're gonna be wasted because many countries, if you send them back either to Malawi, to Colombia, to Peru, they have regulations and they just cannot apply uh, products that are no longer valid. And I think, if anything, we have had a wonderful experience with the solidarity of developing the vaccines, of having vaccines that work, but we have had an awful experience in terms of social injustice in the way that vaccines have been distributed throughout the world. I think that's a really important point. And there was quite a bit of conversation in our first panel um, around access issues and 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 whether the vac it was vaccine hesitancy that was driving some of the lower coverage rates that we were seeing, or whether it was actually an access problem. Um, it seems that we are in um, a concordance that of thought that it is actually an access problem. Uh, in LMICs and in these other regions that were presented on in this session um, and not a hesitancy problem. But I am interested to hear if uh, if any of you have more to say on that topic um, around this, this gap between calling it access and calling it hesitancy or, or what the actual causal factor is. Perhaps I can just start and, and the colleagues can add. Uh, I, I do think it's an access issue. Um, and because the hesitancy, uh, you know, ha the, the, the longer you actually keep these populations without a vaccine, then more you create room for the disinformation to come in, for the confusions to kick in. And um, I, think, I think, you know, if, if you think about uh, what would be the consequences of this unfortunate social injustice, as Oscar has just described it very accurately, one is obviously economic one, uh, you know, the people are 
not able to work, that has an economic impact. But the other one is actually on hesitancy because you know, people may actually become uh, more hesitant as, as the time progresses. So I think, I think it's, it's, uh, the, the hesitancy was not a major factor in these populations who thought that you know, having a vaccine is a way out you know, from, uh, you know, that they could go back to work. And that was essential because, you know, a big proportion of these populations that live in informal sectors and uh, there is no far low scheme, there is no uh, social safety net. So, so they actually saw a uh, vaccine as a way out of their, you know, in, impending uh, imminent poverty, if you like. But the more we wait, perhaps we increase the likelihood of hesitancy in these populations. Maybe I can add to that um, uh, what Rajiv just said and, and put it maybe in another perspective. Again, I always think, you know, product wise. And when you're um, going to eventually uh, roll out a new technology, you know, similar to when you roll out the new Apple iPhone or the new Android, whatever, or, you know, some funky, you know, gadget. There's always, of course, those early adopters, but then there's always those that, you know, kind of like hesitate because, you know, it's a novel technology, right? You want to kind of make sure that it, it sort of works. And I think that that was, um, and I hope we can, you know, talk a little bit about this uh, 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 in, in more detail is as much as indeed there was hoarding and as much as indeed we had some amazing um, uh, uh, vaccine uh, efficacy and certainly even safety with, you know, the, the, the platforms that we started using uh, with the viral vectors and with the RNA, the reality is that they are new technologies. And even though we scientists may have been studying them for a while, the general public sees them as, as an unknown. Um, and we, I think we lost a little bit the perspective that knowing that eventually we would need a lot of doses of vaccines and the fact that we have a lot of challenges in just scaling and producing and and but in the backdrop of that on top of the not only production challenges people may even be hesitant just because they're new technologies nobody knew the safety of, a, of an rna or a safety of a, a viral vector in the general population that we really didn't pay attention to the conventional technologies, which now we're slowly starting to see that will probably come and save the day, right? We're now hearing how recombinant protein technologies have now been raised a little bit in the priority, not only because there's history of the fact that we have had many licensed vaccines using those conventional technologies, they already have very, um, uh, uh, many years of safety profiles, even though, you know, they may be for other diseases. We know we can make them in buckets, right? Uh, and we even have an ecosystem of producers that, you know, could make them. And the, the supplies um, are probably not as, as complicated as, you know, you know, supplies needed for these new technologies. And I think that if we could have had a, bit, a little bit more balanced portfolio in deciding which vaccines to give the opportunity of being evaluated from the beginning, we could have had vaccines, you know, that uh, are like the RNAs, which maybe indeed they were the most appropriate for the high income countries because they had their suitable, you know, storage conditions and they were certainly more expensive and maybe more afforded by high income economies. But then at the same time, we were giving, you know, an opportunity of very traditional, very low cost, already with a profile of understanding by the communities and even, you know, parents and, and even those informal, uh, um, you know, um, uh, I guess, uh, sectors, you know, around the world. And they were probably going to be the ones who would be the ones filling these gaps in the, in the low middle income country setting. So I think that you know, again, I think Peter Holt has mentioned this in, in one of his uh, commentaries in the prior panel is it was really a, a policy and, and, and decision making and, and governance failure is, you know, we wanted to be quick, but we wanted to be quick. Um, but at the same time, we didn't we didn't really resolve that that quickness was not going to fill the gap of the low middle income countries. While we could have also brought in things like, you know, conventional vaccines that maybe take a little longer to produce and develop, 
but at the end of the day, they are going to come and pretty much, um, you know, fill those gaps that we cannot fill by making sufficient viral vector vaccines or sufficient RNA vaccines. Any thoughts from the other panelists would be great. Um, Dr. Botassi, I, I agree partially with you because uh, the technology to do um, uh, RNA messenger vaccines are, is not that complex if the technology is transferred and is shared and if we provide uh, low and middle income countries with the capacity to produce them. The problem is that we have seen that patents don't want to be liberated. Each one of these vaccines have, I don't know how many ingredients, all of them are protected by different patents. There is all kind of commercial interest aimed to every single item that goes into every single vaccine. And I think right now, the issue that we have in low and middle income countries is that we had thought that Latin America or Africa behave and think like Europe and the US. And the way that they communicate and they behave is completely different. And I think we have underestimated those cultural differences. I don't think it's so much the technology, but yes, the lack of information, the lack of uh, sharing uh, data, uh, sharing clear uh, directions from the government. Uh, and also there is not a lot of um, uh, information of good sources coming through the population. If you try to find information about vaccines, COVID-19 in English, German, it's very easy. But if you try to find it in Spanish, it's extremely difficult. And therefore, that gives a lot of space uh, for, you had heard the, about the, the tsunami of ivermectin that we had in Latin America, the tsunami of chlorodioxide or Clorox, uh, or, or all kinds of weird things that have been utilized because there has been a space that we have left behind in order to inform the population. And the same is happening with vaccines. And I think we need to think now long-term, it's not just to donate and to give them vaccines, it's not just to give them fish, it's to teach them how to fish. And now these countries need the, the infrastructure and the technology to be able to produce their vaccines. Because we might be facing a virus that is gonna be endemic and we're gonna be having to vaccinate this population three, four, five, I don't know how many times in the future, hopefully not, but that is the reality. Can I just also quickly uh, add with, with Oscar? just said I, th I think when it comes to technology and uh, you know kind of future proofing uh, our uh, vaccines for future pandemics uh, and I, I think it's quite clear that uh, you know we would not be out of the woods if the whole world is is not uh, you know safe so why would we still looking at uh, technologies which are very difficult to scale up in low-income settings uh, you know, things like mRNA vaccines require, you know, ultra uh, temperature uh, maintenance. Uh, you know, ca can we not, uh, you know, think about technologies which would, you know, not be so thermostatic, uh, rela you know, we, we, we can, can we not think about those kinds of technology that would actually suit uh, the infrastructure and the, and the requirements of the low and middle income countries? I think when it comes to the product, the, the technology, uh, th that is something that perhaps we, uh, you know, the, the scientists should keep in mind as well, uh, given all of what we are just discussing. It, it seems too that this is a communications failure, potentially. Um, Maria, as you had mentioned that, you know, if it is new technologies that this needs to be better communicated so that the population understands what that newness means and, and why we feel that they're safe and why do we feel that they're effective. And Oscar, you had mentioned in your presentation um, the relationship of, of kind of a communication breakdown that was leading to some vaccine hesitancy. Um, and I think your slide may have used the word suspicion, if I'm remembering correctly, um, around around vaccinations. And I'm curious about where our, our health behavior colleagues are um, and our psychologists um, who have been, you know, working in you know, how to build effective communications based on behavior theories. We've heard about social cognitive theory being used um, to increase vaccination rates, um, diffusion of innovation theory when we're talking about a new technology, possibly. I know that they're all clamoring to be involved. Do you feel that this is just an issue of um, the communicators and the policymakers not tapping into this wealth of resource about how to communicate effectively for behavior change? Or um, is there something that's being lost in translation? What are your thoughts there around how we can communicate better? May I jump in if the, my colleague speakers uh, allow me? 
I think yeah, we, so that question we, is for you. We are, as scientists, we are far too detached from reality. Uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, I realized that people actually no longer look at newspapers or see um, CNN or stuff like that. They're actually communicating in WhatsApp chains and, and talking in Facebook. And that's where the communication was taking place. In Twitter, where the scientists discussing against Trump. And for the rest, the normal people, they were communicating either in Facebook or in WhatsApp chains, etc. And we as scientists, we were not doing anything to communicate and engage with the normal people. I think it's not just for psychologists. It's not just for behavioral scientists. I think in a pandemic is a situation in which affects us all. And we all as scientists, as public health practitioners, as epidemiologists, as medical doctors, are members of society. We need to play an active role in sharing knowledge and trying to find a simplistic way in which we can communicate not just between us as colleagues, we all know what we are doing. The problem is people in the street are not hearing what we are talking about in a clear term. If it's difficult for scientists to read some papers that are already beyond their field for the general population, it's almost impossible. So we have a responsibility to distill this information and to bring it as simple as possible. And this is not just for one sector of the scientific community, it's for every single member of the scientific and academic community. Well, I, I totally agree uh, with you, Oscar, and I would even add even beyond that, right, that, you know, it, 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 within even our own universities and our, uh, um, us as, as academics, uh, you know, at some level, we also do a very poor job at training the next generation to actually be communicators, right? You know, we're very good at training ourselves to do the very complex scientific activities wherever you know our fields are so i think that needs to be that's need, that needs to change right we need to incorporate science communication or uh, at some level you know some some skills because you're right i mean we have always been perceived as you know the crazy scientist behind the laboratory right you know that doesn't have any social skills to be able to communicate what we're doing so that you know i think so so i think academically we, we, we should do a lot better than that. Um, another perspective maybe, Oscar, is also you mentioned not only certainly the scientific community and all at all in all disciplines, but also um, regulators. Um, uh, how you know regulators have been absolutely absent from from the communications, right? Which at the end of the day, we keep saying in the public domain that, who eventually are the final decision makers are committees that either advise the regulatory bodies or the fact that behind this, you know, uh, um, I guess, wall of who is the regulatory bodies, who, who comprised, you know, the, the, the members of these regulatory bodies, I think they need to be more vocal um, and really explain why they made some decisions, which, of course, you know, are evidence based and scientific based, but you know, that, that then, that then, you know, are not um, distorted also by the government officials being the ones who are making these announcements, right? So I think that I agree that, you know, the area of um, communication and, and, and at all levels, the different stakeholders, you know, uh, need to also be better trained. Um, and then, of course, you know, uh, one thing that I have had uh, a lot of experience recently and in my country, Honduras, is working also with the journalists because we don't have a lot of science journalism, um, you know, within some of our, our countries, right? I mean, there's journalism in general, but we don't have a we don't have a culture of scientific journalism, and and you know, and I think our you know certainly Latin America has a tendency of always being very political journalism not a lot of scientific journalists. So we need to also train the other disciplines, not only scientific disciplines. So back to you all. So I wanna switch gears here slightly and kind of bring the economic impact into view a little bit. Uh, Dr. Chatter, your presentation touched on this as did yours, uh, Dr. Franco. And when we're talking about, you know, pandemic preparedness in terms of building resiliency, um, at a national level, I'm interested in everyone's perspectives on how we see the future economic impact 
in LMICs, particularly those that rely so heavily on tourism and how their economies can not only begin to rebuild, but to build in some resiliency to that impact for, for future pandemics. I think we all um, are probably shared the, the opinion that this is likely not the last one that we're gonna see in our lifetimes. Um, and also what the multiplicative effect could be of impacts to the availability of international aid and how that's you know, gonna impact health systems, how that's gonna impact economic rebuilding um, for those vulnerable nations. So I just, I open that to the floor um, and join as you will. Uh, maybe again, I can, I can start um, and others can join. So uh, I, I, as I said, some of the countries in South Asia, uh, you know, they're very heavily reliant on, uh, uh, on tourism. And, and, and many other you know, low and income countries uh, worldwide as well. So I think what would be extremely important for these countries is to come up with a cohesive um, approach strategy, which would basically make sure that um, the vaccination status is something that they will consider while allowing the tourists in their countries. Uh, they, they also have to have a very strong framework of uh, track and trace uh, you know, across the countries, uh, because what we saw in Maldives, for example, what we saw in, in Sri Lanka recently as well, uh, you know, the, the, the infections were brought by, you know, uh, by the tourists. So I think, I think there needs to be a proper, uh, perhaps, uh, revisit of, of, of that uh, sector, uh, and, and the government needs to, you know, uh, play a key role on that. It's, it's really difficult because, uh, you know, the, these countries also don't want to send a wrong, you know, signal that, you know, we, we, we the, the, the tourists are not welcome. You know, Egypt, for example, you know, had that dilemma, uh, you know, uh, how strict they, they can be for, for letting people in. And the country was economically struggling. So I think, I think uh, but there needs to be some cohesive strategy uh, when it comes to tourism industry, that sector. And that will probably vary by context to context. Uh, so, so that that needs to be decided at the, at the local level. But it would be very good to have some some broad uh, oversee, some broad uh, you know guidance from uh, you know the uh, the global institutions on that. Uh, with respect to uh, health system strengthening, I think uh, you know making uh, these health systems more resilient, and, and what could be uh, done. I think I think there are, there are a lot that could be done, and uh, what I really genuinely believe uh, that would be lasting, would be sustainable, is if these countries actually try to find resources within their, uh, you know, um, uh, what is already available by repurposing different, you know, our environments uh, rather than relying on external aid. I think I think that would be. The, the, the sustainable way forward would be finding innovative ways of, um, you know, um, strengthening the health systems uh, rather than uh, relying on external aid. If I may add, uh, I, I think we do have an issue with economic recovery. Nevertheless, things are going a lot better than we expect. Uh, Dr. Botasio probably knows this better than me, but uh, countries, for example, like Honduras, has seen an economic increase or growth between in the last six months that is over 12%. The same in countries like Colombia. All over what we are seeing is that the economic crisis that we foresaw that was gonna be so enormous or similar to the one that we experienced towards the end of 2007, 2008, has not been uh, as long lasting as that one. And I want to be positive and optimist that we are in the road and in the path to recovery. We will not get back to what used to be, but we are gradually getting there. And I think what we need to invest is in generation of employment, uh, protecting our resources in, in Latin America, which comes together. We talk about planetary health, we talk about the economic crisis, we talk about COVID-19, all these things come together. And I think the priorities now for low and middle income countries should be among those planetary health. And I think uh, uh, betting to the natural resources that we have in these kind of countries, in hand in hand with, uh, with a tourism that is not aggressive and is protective of our resources, I think come together towards the future of the recovery of these regions. Solidarity and expecting money coming from European Union or from high income countries, I don't think is going to be the solution. 
as we had seen with the vaccines already. I think the countries need to have uh, an independent, proactive approach towards economic recovery, and they are in the right pathway, I think. I, I would totally agree with both of you. And, and remember, I think the power here is in, in partnership and collaboration, right? I mean, we've definitely seen that there was a little bit of a wake-up call with all the banking uh, um, uh, structures, right? You know, certainly in Latin America, Central America with the Central American Development Bank, with the Inter-American Development Bank. Now they really are realizing that health, it's not isolated just there, that it has to be integrated as a, as a secure national regional security, right? I really like your comment about planetary health, because if you remember even last year, we had not only the COVID and then two hurricanes in Central America. And that, again, woke up everybody that it's just all interconnected, right? You know, we have to be able to have resilience integrate with an integrated approach. And I think what we're starting to see is the benefits of Honduras by itself may not be as strong as if they were Honduras, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, you know, and maybe, as, you know, get together with Dominican Republic, which is already part of the, you know, at least the Sica countries, you know. And so I think the power is, you know, how do you really work together to to then even share some of these capacities that you want to build regionally. Like, you know, one example is I have been working pretty closely with, you know, uh, the different countries in Central America where we all have different capabilities and even interests based on where we are, based on location, based on, of course, our even historical um, infrastructure. Costa Rica does really well in some areas of technology. Panama, you know, certainly has, you know, a lot of history even in, tropical disease prevention with the Gorgas. And, you know, now that we have a new science and technology minister really pushing, you know, a little bit the agenda, um, you know, Honduras, you know, has great maquilas where they can probably even make, you know, a lot of products, you know, uh, with regards to masks or even, you know, PPE, you know, Guatemala has been usually a star in um, uh, surveillance, right? Health, you know, system surveillance, the CDC, their CDC offices there for years, right? Doing, doing that kind of work. So it's all the fact that we need people to talk to each other more. And, and even though each country has, of course, its own national, you know, interest and responsibility, but regionally they can do, they could have so much more power to, you know, working together, um, especially when you want to advance these types of, um, you know, global health technology capability um, infrastructure development. I fully agree with you, uh, Maria. I think the other other aspect is, uh, that, for example, in Bangladesh, in, in, in South Asia, there has been a lot of chats going on with respect to how, uh, you know, the, the, the goods which are being exported, you know, that that can be further um, widened, if you like, because the products have been really narrow. Uh, you know, in India, for example, the, the, the key sectors are service sectors, uh, you know, things like IT or uh, perhaps the coal centers or the RMGs, you know, the, the, the garments factories. Um, or, so they're low tech manufacturing. So I think these countries can come together, they can exchange technology and, uh, you know, go for uh, more, in, you know, um, kind of high tech manufacturing as well. Uh, to widening, uh, to diversify their uh, portfolio a bit more. Uh, I, think, I think those are the kinds of innovation uh, that's needed from within these countries across these regions uh, so that the economy is a bit more future-proof. Uh, uh, I, th I think that that is another lesson that, that these countries definitely have got. I want to bring that back to um, a question specifically for Dr. Botazi. Um, as you know, we've had in conversation, the children feel a disproportionate burden of economic impact. And I'm curious about your concerns um, or your hopes for the future about how children have really been impacted by COVID-19 globally um, in terms of you know, orphanhood and increased vulnerability and things of that nature, um, not, you know, in, including as well, the rates of, of Delta variant infections um, among kids abroad um, and around the world. So would you just speak a little bit to your to your thoughts on on the role of 
children and, and how they're being impacted by this economic impact and its relationship with the pandemic? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, unfortunately, the reality is that our children are our future. And our children, you know, have lost, you know, education with the disruption of the schooling, you know, so we're really, you know, have a, you know, I don't know how they're going to really recover. And, 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 and let's put it in perspective, right? You know, in fact, uh, very interestingly, my dad um, has, uh, you know, a, a family that lives with him to help him in Honduras. And, you know, uh, there's a, a small uh, girl that lives with us in, you know, in our home. And we have seen how difficult it is for them to learn when they have to do things remotely when at least, you know, this girl was in my house and had access to internet and we could give her a computer. But many people don't even have access and they were trying to do everything on your cell phone and, you know, and with data and, you know, right. So education disaster, right. Who knows if we're going to really recover, you know, the intellect, you know, uh, um, of these of these children, you know, when when we come back to some normality, we've lost. I think it was mentioned this morning too. Is that we've seen a a, a disruption in the traditional pediatric vaccine um, uh, delivery of all the pediatric vaccine, and so we have to do a, an enormous catch up in ensuring that now we increase coverages of that normal traditional vaccines that these kids also um, have. I apologize that there's some beeping because they're dealing with my alarm system at home. Um, so, you know, again, you know, health delays. Then the fact that we probably have not paid a good attention to the, um, you know, other interventions, right? Whether it's neglected disease interventions like the warming practices or um, um, other, you know, non-communicable uh, attention. So I think that our kids are probably going to show us that in the long COVID sequelae are, we're gonna see burdens and um, an impact of this COVID two year pandemic up to now, probably for the next decade, if not more. Uh, Dr. Chugger, Dr. Franco, did you want to add anything to that? Yes, I think um, if if you don't mind, if I will go first, uh, but just adding to the comments of Dr. Botassi, uh, we are talking about the region like Latin America, where uh, yes, we are talk we need economic recovery. Yes, we need to work uh, towards improvements after COVID. However, we still have an important issue in human rights, and among those human rights, uh, we've seen a lot of violence against girls and women, and still this needs to be prioritized and improved. Until we don't have improvements in human rights, there is not, um, I don't think that uh, economic recovery or prosperity uh, reserve as uh, such a high priority unless we guarantee that the basic human rights of these populations are, can be guaranteed and improvements in uh, the freedom, in the liberty, and the access um, to services from the poorest. And in particular, I talk again about violence against girls and women which I think is a, a very important issue that got even more affected during the pandemic, during the confinement with people being in the same space and uh, girls and children losing the protection that they have from academic centers. I think that um, generated even more issues on this regard. And I think we need to prioritize human rights and again, rights of the poorest, rights of women in Latin America um, beyond prosperity. Yeah, I'll just echo, you know, what, what has already been said. I think, I think when it came to children, um, there has been several implications health-wise. You know, we've seen how the, the, the vaccination programs across South Asia have been impacted, um, how, uh, you know, uh, when the kids got uh, infected, uh, how the long COVID in, in, in kids, you know, have, have made them suffer for over months, um, you know, uh, but not only just health uh, and, and mental health is something that uh, Oscar has already mentioned, but also with respect to education. Uh, some of the countries in South Asia, they have only recently reopened their schools. So there hasn't been any you know, uh, facility-based teaching uh, in, a, in, a, in the last 18 months or so in some of these countries. And that is a lost uh, you know, education uh, generation, if you like. You know, uh, they, these, these kids will 
we'll, we'll, we'll have to do a lot of catching up when it comes to uh, the primary and secondary education. So, um, so I think, I think uh, there are several um, uh, lessons that we have learned from, from this experience in the past 18 months when it comes to, uh, when it comes to children. There seems to be a real confluence of factors in you know, areas where you have multi-generational households, you have older generations that are of higher vulnerabilities living with younger children and exchanging disease. You have increases in orphanhood with, when those children lose their primary caregiver in those settings, economic impact loss when parents are losing their jobs. And then the children, you know, as was mentioned, are losing the protections that those academic centers provided them, but also nutrition in many cases um, so there just seems to be, you know, a multi multitude of, of factors that are impacting kids um, during this pandemic. And uh, Dr. Botazzi, I wanted to ask you about the vaccine, uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine platform that you're working on at Baylor. And if you could speak to that a little bit um, and let us know, you know, what kind of future optimism um, your efforts might be bringing to the forefront. Well, thank you uh, so much, Andrea. Well, yes, I mean, it's going back to the notion of, uh, um, you know, developing vaccines that uh, will, one, fill the gap of the need. Um, and, you know, our vaccine uh, and our vaccine center has been working for now, you know, a couple of decades, certainly on parasitic uh, disease vaccines, which, by the way, a great win for the for for the world, you know, having have approval of the malaria vaccine for for, you know, for children. Um, which again predicates on, you know, parasitic uh, disease vaccines as as high priority. Even though some of our diseases are morbidity diseases or not killer diseases, but you know, it's a it's a big win for all of us that work in parasitic diseases. Um, and but we also the fact that we want to uh, uh, develop interventions that are going to eventually easily adapted, adopted, scaled. Um, affordable and, and so that they could indeed uh, contribute to the equitable access and delivery and distribution. So our vaccine uh, that we have developed for the COVID-19, you know, stems from 10 years of working on prior coronaviruses. We used to have a program on SARS and MERS. We rely on a production system that is the same way how hepatitis B vaccines are made, which is recombinant proteins made on yeast. Um, so again, easily um, uh, understood, you know, uh, scientifically as well, of course, as, um, you know, a lot of data on protein-based vaccines um, with already an ecosystem of producers. So we were very lucky that we now have uh, licensed our construct technology uh, to Biological E in India, as well as Biopharma in Indonesia, for them to then fashion it into a vaccine that could be um, deployed and fill not only the gaps that we need uh, globally or regionally, but also potentially be a source of booster vaccines. As you know, I think one of the uh, uh, worries that we have with uh, uh, the COVAX mechanism or even at some level uh, with the, the global uh, governance of how vaccines are going to continue having to be subsidized is that there's going to be a point where countries are going to not be able to sustain uh, purchasing vaccines that are too expensive, right? Um, you know, the normal uh, um, vaccines that generally you can get through the PAHO revolving fund or even through, you know, the Gavi or, you know, UNICEF. The ideal is that you have vaccines that, you know, cost no more than a couple dollars per dose, right? You, don't, you can't really afford 30, 40, 50 dollar a dose vaccines, you know, especially in low middle income countries. So these vaccines have the potential of keeping also those costs very low. Um, can be manufactured worldwide. And then fills also that gap that we've been talking where, you know, hepatitis B vaccines, uh, which is, you know, our, our, our model vaccine where we build a COVID vaccine against, is widely used in pediatrics. And therefore, it's most likely to also be um, potentially well accepted uh, by parents to be deployed in their kids because they basically, you know, already are aware of how hepatitis B um, is safe and has been successful around the world. We do not want to replicate the hepatitis B case where, where it took 20 years after it was, you know, approved to reach LMICs. So um, we're, you know, in our case, we're working with groups such as, you know, PATH, 
um, uh, International Vaccine Initiative to really help us in the communications and um, how these types of vaccines will eventually be deployed in the low middle income country settings. It doesn't have any major um, uh, challenges in um, cold uh, chain management because it's similar to all the vaccines that are already are um, used in the pediatric scheme. So we have a lot of hope. Um, Biological is the one who has the most advanced in its uh, development. Um, they are hopefully getting their um, uh, authorization probably in the next month to initially uh, an indication to use in India. You know, India government has been already committed to um, deploying 300 million doses. I know uh, the company is working with the WHO to get, of course, the emergency uh, listing by WHO, which will then they have a commitment to work with COVAX uh, for the rest of the world and BioPharma has um, uh, indicated their um, intent to work with the uh, Islamic uh, countries, right? You know, we actually gave them a construct that is halal uh, ready and suitable, which is something that, you know, again, we culturally are very uh, conscious of, you know, the ensuring that the right um, uh, uh, trace of where the, the raw materials come from. So I think that, you know, we have been quite a uh, uh, privilege to, to be able to participate in, in with many others trying to move these vaccines. And we are very hopeful that this recombinant protein technology, ours as probably others, uh, will be the ones that are going to be authorized in the coming months. And, and we hope that they will bring that uh, opportunity of bridging that um, not only supply gap, but also maybe uh, increase a little bit the acceptance um, when these vaccines are received in different country settings. Two very important concerns um, in, in your work, I'm sure. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, I We do need to close up a bit here. Um, so I do wanna give each of you uh, just one minute in closing remarks um, to add anything um, that you haven't yet had a chance to voice. So uh, Oscar, if we could start with you. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks everyone for joining. And just a reminder that uh, COVID-19, yes, it has been an issue. It has been a wake up call, but we have a tsunami of issues of non-communicable disorders, planetary health, lifestyle and behavior are the key to be able to improve this. And we need to start promoting, enhancing and facilitating that populations can follow a better lifestyle. And I would like just to close there uh, in, being closer together but more solidarious between human beings but also with other species and with the house where we live which is this planet thank you thank you uh rajiv uh, yeah i think um i'll, I'll just uh, say perhaps a few things that firstly um uh, covid19 pandemic for low and middle income countries is no longer is, is not over and uh, you know we, we what we see that uh, Vaccination is, is something that needs to be really stepped up as soon as possible. And, and that is something, um, you know, is, is, is perhaps the biggest issue as far as regions such as uh, South Asia or Africa is concerned. The economic recovery has been, um, uh, has been promising, but I think it's still fragile. And, uh, uh, you know, another pandemic, um, you know, and, and, and then we have a huge problem again. So I think we have to come up with uh, ways where you know we can actually have uh, resilient societies, uh, in uh, which would be future proof for for this kind of calamities. I think that's that's really important. Um, and and I think uh, solidarity uh, everyone has talked about. I think that is a key. And uh, in in this very connected world, uh, we have seen how fast things can you know affect uh, different different regions. I think we do realize that elimination perhaps is not an option for COVID-19 anymore. So we will have to continue um, this uh, global collaboration to tackle problems uh, at, at this kind of uh, scale. So, so yeah, and, and thank you everyone for, for inviting me and uh, really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you, Rajiv. Maria. Well, first, uh, thanks uh, for inviting me to join you in the panel. I really enjoyed not only this morning's presentations and discussions, but you know, hearing both uh, Rajiv's and Oscar's perspectives. And I appreciate also that you know that you let me 
you know, uh, brag a little bit about certainly the work that we do in the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development. But again, it's a reminder to everyone um, that indeed we're not, you know, really out of the COVID-19 pandemic, that it does require integrated approaches. I think we confirm that, you know, vaccines alone uh, will not, you know, do all the job that, you know, we need. We need a lot more, um, you know, tools, including, of course, uh, not only pharmaceutical tools, but, you know, um, non-pharmaceutical tools, uh, but, but that we have to start thinking also on the future. And therefore, I hope that we don't have um, a quick uh, amnesia event uh, uh, where, you know, we go back to at some level when we kind of normalize a little bit that we don't put a sustainable uh, support in continuing not only the research and development, you know, certainly, you know, as we mentioned, the uh, approaches to be to uh, to uh, um, address planetary health, the integration, of course, of all the disciplines, uh, you know, to to prevent the next uh, pandemic, whether it's a COVID uh, related or coronavirus related, or whether it's a flu pandemic or or an unknown pathogen. I think we re came to the realization we, as much as we thought we could have some readiness, we really did not have readiness enough. Um, and so we need uh, sustainable reminders that, you know, that we need to continue becoming better at all different levels uh, and with all different sectors. And I hope that we academically can contribute, you know, uh, working, you know, certainly with FIU and us at Baylor and Texas Children's to start thinking also how we can train the next generation because ultimately they're the ones who are gonna become our leaders and, and those who are going to craft the, the strategies and the policies. And so we need to make sure that we remind them um, of, of, of this pandemic, um, you know, that we don't forget, uh, you know, what, what this has caused and the enormous, uh, uh, not only deaths, but long-term effects that we're gonna continue seeing. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really do want to thank the three of you for joining us today. I know it comes at great sacrifice of personal and professional time, and we really value your expertise and your experience and, and the discussion we've been able to have today. I encourage anyone listening, if you want to hear more from many of our panelists, if you want to continue the conversation around COVID-19, or if you're really interested in these other topics that have been mentioned, but we haven't had the time to really dive into in terms of planetary health, non-communicable diseases, how we protect women and children, um, adolescent health and those issues, I encourage you to visit ghc.fiu.edu and take a look at the Global Health Conference uh, for 2021 that is being held in Cartagena, Colombia this year. Um, we will have streaming available um, for some of those and, and sessions will be recorded as well, but you're also welcome to register um, and travel and meet us there. Um, so we'll be continuing a lot of this uh, important discussion um, at that conference. Um, also, today's discussion has been recorded. It will also be available on our website later on if anyone wants to go back and rewatch any of its portions. Um, you will receive a survey via email today. We really encourage you to take that and fill that out. It's very brief, very few questions. Um, and that's important for us to continue to improve these conversations, um, make them bigger, make them better, um, as we, we always want to do. And of course, certificates for attendance will be automatically emailed um, once your survey is submitted. Um, so we're going to transition now into our closing remarks. Um, so keep your seats for just one more moment, and we will see you on the next screen for closing comments.
Well, we come to the end uh, of this uh, uh, third and last uh, COVID-19 uh, summit. It has been a great experience, not only today, but during the whole uh, year, the two previous events. And uh, I just want to thank uh, all of you for, for your excellent participation, recommendations, suggestions. I think we can build uh, a plan uh, for, for the near future. Uh, following the recommendations uh, also from Maria Elena on how to to really um, uh, develop the the new um, generations on, on immunization and policy and, and uh, global health. So we need we really need to to get together and and develop this 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 plan for the next uh, next year. I also want to to thank uh, Maria Elena and Peter and the Baylor College for, for the great contribution and support in this idea. We hope to continue next year, not only with this uh, initiative, but with others that we are having in, in mind. And, uh, and uh, for sure, we will have a very, very good future in, uh, in, in global health. Now with our new Department of Global Health, uh, just uh, recently created at, at the College of Public Health. Um, I don't want to extend uh, and take more time now. I, I just uh, um, say gracias, muchas gracias, muchas gracias. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you. You were really um, a great uh, a contributors to, to this uh, initiative. And uh, I just leave the floor to, to Maria Elena to say goodbye. Hope to see you in the Global Health Conference. And if not, uh, next year in Miami in the conference and in other activities that we will announce uh, by the end of the year, probably. So goodbye, saludos, abrazos a todos. Maria Elena. Yes, thank you, Carlos, and uh, the entire FIU team, and certainly all the panelists and presenters today and with the prior two sessions. It has been a privilege for us at Baylor College of Medicine and our Texas Children's uh, Center to uh, partner with you all in this three series and very much look forward certainly to now many more activities that we're going to be doing together. Um, but I think we, we close uh, mostly thanking all of you who have uh, always joined us. I, you know, I know that we have um, very good attendance. Uh, I keep seeing my Facebook uh, uh, lighting up and the Twitter lighting up. Um, you know, uh, tweeting about you know the uh, you know information and just uh, thanking for the forum to be able to have these types of conversations. So it's just been a privilege, and um, we now uh, can start thinking then again. You know, what what are the kinds of things that we should be uh, continuing the conversation? So please send your feedback, um, and I'm sure Carlos and his team will come up with another crazy idea of putting another summit together and we will with we will we'll be with you and um, supporting you because we really enjoy and again i think we've noticed that this is the best way that we can really share um, truthful transparent and certainly evidence-based uh, uh, type of uh, information and have a nice dialogue and 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 improve uh, our future. So thank you very much, Carlos, for this opportunity. Okay. Well, goodbye to all. Adios. Have a good weekend.